Okay, let me first tell who I am. I'm Hans Sinifel. I'm a professor currently at Nazarbayev University in Kazakhstan, in Astana, and the city has been renamed again today. Surprisingly, it was it was called Astana all the time until three years ago. Then the okay, then the president Nazarbayev resigned and they renamed the, the city in his honor after his first name as Nur Sultan. But they renamed it back. It was never popular, and I think most people are happy that it was renamed back. Let me tell uh, something about Kazakhstan. So the present state of Kazakhstan uh, is, exists since 1991. It's, uh, it's split off from the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union fell apart. But uh, Kazakh as a national identity uh, and exists much longer, really since the Middle Ages. So since uh, I think there's an exact year 1490. That's, uh, so Nazarbayev University was established in 2010. That's 12 years ago. Before that, there uh, was a program to stand, send the uh, best students of Kazakhstan abroad. But now we are, uh, but, uh, yeah, now we have our own university. We, and we, it's really aimed at building up a, a Western a US or European style university. That, that's our goal. So we currently have, have uh, almost 5,000 undergraduate students, 1,600, uh, 1600 graduate students, and 590 students in the foundational year. And in the foundational year, students uh, yeah, basically learn English and learn. Uh, and basically, I explained that this is a is a serious university, and uh, and basically the, I, I taught how to behave on a good university. So everyone needs to speak English, the staff and students alike, and all the important decisions are merit only. That's important. Uh, only only the only grades matter, and many and some of the admission decisions they are not even made here. Their the results are sent abroad and graded abroad and uh, brought back to us. So I am in the School of Engineering and Digital Sciences, and uh, we have 2,000 undergraduate students. It's the biggest school, actual, actually, and 500 graduate students. And then in this uh, in this school, the, the, the CS department has more than 1,000 students that is still growing. So CS is really the biggest department here. And we have uh, vacancies because we have a uh, uh, growing number of students, but not growing number of staff. So is, uh, you can apply. Okay, so now we come to parsing, to Mafon, to really the main topic. So how did this start? So I am developing a programming language for the implementation of logic. And uh, you must think of uh, verification of mathematical proofs and theory improving. And, and this language needs a parser, of course. This is one thing. And another thing is I have been teaching compiler construction. And... Uh, and I have been using always Java as the implement. Yeah, I've been using Java as implementation language. And the reason for this is simply that there exist very nice tools for Java, like uh, JFlex, which is uh, an adaptation of Lex to Java, and an automated yeah, and an automated parser generator, which is called uh, Cup, which is uh, I think is. Uh, it's a creation of useful parsers, and it, it's really a very nice tool. It works very nice. And now I want for my own language to use C++, and then I started looking for similar tools for C++, and I noticed that they are lacking. So so in particular, there existed a well-known uh, Bison and uh, Yak and also Lex, but they, uh, they are really C tools. So, of course, uh, C++ is, is, uh, C is a subset of C++, but so you... What works for C usually works for C++, but, uh, but you're not using anything of C++. In particular, if you want to have attributes uh, in your parser, if you want to compute things, you have to do all the man memory management by yourself in C. While C++ has like uh, has semi-automatic memory management. I mean, you, you know, the semi-automatic means that the writer of a class has to write it, but the user of the class uh, has it automatic. So, so, if, so if you... Yeah, so we, I wanted something that truly supports C++. So, and then in future versions of the compiler construction, I would like to use C++. Java is nice, but C++ is nicer. Okay. So, yeah, okay, now about parser generators. So if you, uh, and tools, if you have something like big, like C++ or C or Java, right, these languages are so big and have such a momentum that uh, you don't need any automatic tools for that. The, the syntax does not change of C++ and uh, and the resources to uh, the, the complete resources spent uh, to uh, say to designing the language to implementing the compiler and uh, and uh, it's, yeah, so big that uh, that uh, yeah that the cost of, uh, of of creating the parser compared to that is small. 
but for experimental languages like mine and so maybe for uh, for many other systems they are useful it's it's very easy to make changes in the syntax with a parser generator to try out something and uh, you just change the grammar and like uh, one minute later you have another parser so i decided uh, to write a tokenizer generator and parser generator by myself uh, and another important point for me at least is i'm a university teacher i teach uh, automata construction i teach formal languages and i i want to show that it's useful that it is works so i want to uh, yeah, what, I, what you teach is what works, is what I want, is always my point, yes. So let's, uh, okay, what is parsing? I, I suppose you know, but let's, uh, let's uh, explain it shortly. So in computer science, uh, especially theoretical, no, in computer science, nearly everything is a tree, or can be represented as a tree. Okay, so, so now we have an input of sequ a sequence of characters, and the task of the parser is just uh, to extract the tree structure from that, from this sequence of, of, of uh, characters. And then the resulting tree is, uh, is usually called abstract syntax tree. And so for the compiler, that's then the further basic for further, uh, in the case of a compiler, that's the further basic for, uh, for translation. So then you do the type checking, you resolve the, the types, you decide where are the loads, and then you can uh, lower the code. And so. So it is just an example of a C++ statement or a C statement. If C is between A and Z as capitals, then we want them to uh, to transform that to lowercase. So we take out the big, we subtract the big A and we add small a. And so this would be a parse tree of it. So the if is on top. We have the condition here. This is the condition. This would be the statement. The condition is an end between those two conditions. This then the main operator comes on top and then C greater than A or C less or equals Z. This is the statement plus is C minus. I mean, you could have some more, uh, say, nodes, uh, say, which are not really important here. Okay. Okay, now tokenizing, what is tokenizing? So uh, this, the first part, uh, parsing consists usually of two, of two, uh, of two steps. And it's a bit, uh, the, the terminology is usually confusing. So in the first step, you, you just take the stream of characters and you, you cut it into small parts, which, uh, yeah, which are the building blocks of the language, which are treated essentially like atomic by the next step. And, uh, and then the next step is, is the parsing proper, which will uh, construct a tree. And so parsing is, uh, it has no nesting. And tokenizing has no nesting. So, so tokens typically have the following forms. You have numbers, which can be integer floating point numbers. You can have uh, I mean, strings, for example. Actually, in C, C++ strings are quite complicated. You have uh, escape characters, and I think you can also, uh, they can go over another over the next line, so you can cut them off with a slash and then go on in the next line. Then, of course, you have reserved words and operators. You have comments, which uh, should be ignored. Yeah, and then in some languages like Python, you have uh, indentation changes, and they should uh, they should uh, yeah they should be counted as tokens. So if you if you know Python in in Python, when you write a, a while, and then the, the the scope of this while is uh, de determined by indentation. So you have to in the next line to indent, say so three spaces more, and uh, and this this uh, this has the same effect as the curly bracket uh, as the brace in C plus plus. And then when the indentation stops, the the, this is considered the end of the scope of the while, and so that, that should generate a token that then the, the, the parser sees and knows that uh, the scope of the while ends. So, tokenizers, I have, uh, say, uh, maybe 20 years I was trying parsers, writing uh, some small parsers, and tokenizers are always borderline, if, if it's worth automating them or not. Because you, you always think, you know, tokenizing is not so hard, so let's just write it out. and. Uh, the, yeah, so, and I, I, okay. But on the other hand, there exists a really nice theory for recognizing and classifying tokens, right? So you can write the regular expressions. This can be converted by non-deterministic, into non-deterministic finite automata. These you can make deterministic and then you can uh, minimize them. So we teach this and, uh, but on, this was the situation. But on the other hand, uh, that, uh, if you I want to use this in real, that is always, uh, say, borderline useful. So, so so why did I not use an existing implementation? So, okay, this is basically this. Uh, the, I think the problem is the lack of flexibility. This is this is always, uh, you always think, let's use a tokenizer. 
but then there is always something that doesn't fit in. Like, uh, like if you use a regular expression language, then uh, my logic language you would use Python style indentation, and th this indentation cannot be modeled with regular expressions. You need to keep keep separate track of the indentation, and whenever it changes, you generate a token. Then I also would like to use uh, such comments, which can be nested. And uh, I mean, as you may know, nest everything that can be nested uh, can be not a regular automaton, can, because uh, because you nest actually the, yeah you need to remember the nesting depth which has no which has no theoretical upper bound, and so and and that cannot be uh, so there is no finite limitation and hence the, because of that a finite automaton cannot deal with it. So the, so the, this this token would be. Uh, May, immediately makes all regular, uh, say, say, how do you call it? Uh, the old standard uh, base approach is based on uh, regular expressions unusable. And then, for example, long comments uh, of this form, but the, the usual, the, just the standards uh, C, C++ comments, they should not be stored in a buffer. It's better to treat them separately. Oh, yeah. And then there exists some languages uh, where the where you cannot really separate the tokenizing from the parsing. Like in uh, some languages, uh, need to have uh, X, the tokenizer must know what are the types. This is, uh, if in C++, you write A times B, semicolon. What this could be that you multiply A times B and throw the results uh, away. Or it could mean that you declare B of type A, of a pointer to type A, and that A is a point, is a type. So in, so in, and in order to decide that the parser, the tokenizer needs already to know if this A is a type or a, or a variable. Oh yeah, and then some languages like C++ 11 allows uh, allows this to be in uh, can close to uh, two templates at once, right? And this is allowed in C++. And in order and in other in all other contents, this is just a shift right, so the print operator. So and so that means that the tokenizer needs to know if. Uh, if this if that if it could be closing a template and in that case uh, if it could be closing two templates and in that case it should be generating these tokens separately so this there, there is always uh, there are always subtle things which uh, yeah which uh, in the end block you from using the automatic tools so and this was also for my language so i hesitated long but in the end, I decided to do to write it, but so with these goals in mind, so that it must be possible uh, flexibility. If you, the, it, it must be possible always to create some tokens by hand, and so be, and uh, and also the tokenizer must not dictate how source information is handled. And then, as, as I already said, it must be useful in education. I, I teach, uh, I show these automata constructions, and I want to I want to be able to yeah, to show them to the students, and I want them to work, and I want uh, to be efficient. But up to the point where the flexibility has to be sacrificed, I think as soon as you have to choose between efficiency and flexibility, you should choose the flexibility. Okay. So what I create is uh, the building blocks for the tokenizer, but not the tokenizer itself. And uh, so I also don't. I will not show. Uh, I mean, I will not show like uh, like this. So this is what you. Okay, I'll show you quickly what uh, this is. This is a Java tool, JFlex. And here you just have a, a list of regular expressions. Here they are. Let's see a few more interesting ones I mean, the, with, with their meaning. But so this I don't. But this I cannot create because if you have that, you cannot. Uh, yeah, then there, there are these extra. There are some of these tokens which are not regular expressions and which then you cannot deal with. So where? So yes. So okay. So. So my my tokenizer tool does not generate a complete. So my tokenizer tool does not generate a complete tokenizer. So you have to uh, so you have to enter and because you want to recognize some tokens by yourself, you have to uh, yeah to interact with the file reader class with the input and the and this goes by means of a file reader class which has the following interface, which I think is not so. Yes, it contains a pointer to a file, but you don't need to know that. And it and it also keeps track of line number and column position, and it it and it keeps a buffer of characters which is initially empty, and and these are the four main methods that you use to interact with the file reader. And said for the tokens that you are defining by yourself. So may, the main there's an operator has uh, and it has n tokens, which 
and it returns true as it has these if it has really these n tokens in the buffer. But if it doesn't have them, it tries to read these tokens. So it, it reads characters from the input source until the buffer has this size n and returns true if it's success, if it has a success and false if it doesn't have a success. So then when you when you have called this has methods, then you can and it returns true, then you know that there are n, n characters, so you can peek them. So so the, the, the method peak i gets the ice character from the buffer. Then you can also get the whole se segment out of the buffer as a string view. It's, it's, it's like peak, but it, it peaks the whole uh, initial segment. And, and then it has a method commit, which basically cuts the first i characters out of the buffer and throws them away. Uh, and of course, you should do this uh, only when you are sure that there are at least i characters in the buffer. Because otherwise it's uh, undefined. Okay. Yes. Okay. So then the so I explained to this because you always have to write a few tokens by hand, but in the end most of them will be recognized automatically. So so for the tokens that you want to recognize by hand, you have to write a function of this form. So it's a function returning a pair of the symbol type, where this can be basically anything what you choose to. Uh, to represent the types as in, typically an enumeration type, but it could be anything. And then the size, which is the, the number of uh, characters that uh, that are in your token. And then something like try x or read x, which reads the uh, which then takes the file reader. So you could so you could write yes. So if the attempt failed, the second field field must be zero. And it is actually possible to to try to try to recognize many tokens at the same time in the same function. So you could have some function try identifier with reserved words, which then uh, yeah, either reads an identifier or or sees that this identifier is a reserved words and then returns a while or if or whatever or as a as a simple type. For example, this one you could have a function try number which. Uh, that returns a symbol type, but which decides if it's an integer or, or a floating point number, and then uh, that should be in the symbol type. So, okay, so here is uh, an example of an uh, of a yeah, of a of a function try identifier that would uh, try to, that tries to read an identifier using this input buffer, this file reader. Okay, so if the input has one character, because otherwise. Uh, there's, otherwise, otherwise, I mean, we have nothing. This, of course, should never be sim in the identity. This must be error. I will correct it. But actually, it doesn't matter. Once, once the once this uh, field is zero, it actually doesn't matter what is here. So it is not really wrong, but we have. Okay. So, but if you have one character, and uh, the, this character could be the start of an identifier, then we then we assume that we read one character, and then as soon as long as we have a next character. Which could be the continuation of an identifier. We increase the i, and then and then when the, we encounter the first character that can be not in an identifier, we return the, the pair symbol ident ident with uh, with i, and, and this is just an enumeration type. Okay, so now, okay, now we of course uh, we want. Uh, a tool, so we don't want to write, because uh, we don't want to write this code. I mean, it's it's still nice. Uh, then uh, it's a nice, reasonably nice interface, but of course we don't want to write such code. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, to basically generate this code automatically for most of the tokens. And this is where the theory comes in. So wait one second. No, it's not here. So yes. So what we write is uh, what we are going to write. We're going to generate automatically a method uh, which is just called read and classify, which takes an automaton as input, one automaton and uh, and the input reader. This is a file reader. This is an automaton. This automaton we re we re we created as a static uh, as a static field. So input and return so. So now we're going to now come the automata. Let's let's quickly say what an automata is. Okay, can I see other questions? No. So 
Okay, let's an, an automata that reads an identifier and the reserved word, and the res, and this reserved word is while. Okay, so right. The, the problem with while is that it can be an identifier also, but of course, if it is while, we prefer that it is while and not an identifier. So in the so we have a starting state. In the starting state, we can read an a, a letter. Uh, capital or non-capital, and then and then once we have done it, we have an identifier. But this will start the identifier in this function, and then as soon as we, as long as we have a letter, capital or non-capital or a digit or an underscore, it it can it, it can remain an identifier. So the, this reads, yeah, this is identifier, and then we have while goes here. So if we see a W, an H, an I, an L, or an E, then we can here accept a while. Okay, now the problem is, of course, if we have, say, a, a, double, a W and an H, then we can go here, but we can also go here, right? We can, the W is in this interval, and then we are here, and then the H is in this interval, so we're here. So if we reach W, H, then can be Q identified, Q it, or we can have Q2. And if we reach the comp complete while, we can be in Q it, and we can be in Q while. Okay, so this this phenomenon is called uh, non-determinism that uh, the automaton can go in different directions on the same input, and we need to deal with that. So, okay, the the solution is uh, is I mean is, we teach this in the third year. So what you do is uh, when you have say the W, you can go to Q eight and to Q one, and we and we we keep this set. So in the end we have this set. If you have W H we are here, and and you make this sets the the states of a new automaton. I mean that's the approach. That's that's fairly standard approach. Okay. Now before okay so now before I go to this automaton as you see them in the in the typical formal language class, but uh, I use a, a bit nicer and simpler way for representing these finite automata. And uh, by the way, this will be presented at a, conf at a theory conference next week. Uh, I think this is games and automata, logic and verification, formal verification. So games, automata, logic, formal verification. So and instead of and the transitions are always labeled with intervals, like here. That is simpler because uh, in, in, nearly everything is treated as an interval. But these intervals they are broken up into two parts. So an interval has a beginning and an end. So I say that here starts the the transition to Q it, and then here at Z after the Z, uh, it it stops this interval. And uh, and I just say from from Z onwards uh, there is uh, there is no transition possible. Then from A is a transition is a transition possible, and then from Z plus one no transition again is possible. Then from the this underscore transition is possible. From underscore plus one no transition is is, is possible. So what I do is I break up the intervals into uh, into the begin into yeah just every interval is broken up into two parts the beginning and the end. Oh yeah, and, and then it's convenient convenience to use relative addressing for the states. I mean like you would use in assembly language because it has the advantage that you can uh, if you have different automata you can just put them behind each other without doing anything. And, and it turns out that this representation uh, simplifies the, uh, the 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 representation, the standard algorithms, which are uh, merging them, determinization and minimization. And it works in, in practice without change, which is nice because you can teach it to students and you can just show it to students working. And you don't have to tell, yeah, okay, now we taught it, but you know, this is not how it is implemented. It's uh, We actually have to deal with the intervals that we have to compress the automata. And, uh, but we don't want to teach that. So, but uh, but so this is what you what you teach is what you use. So states is as I said is represented by a triple, where lambda is a set of integers, which are the relative states, relative transitions, and which represent the the empty transitions. So uh, automata can uh, can move to another state without reading anything, and so this is stored in this lambda. Okay, then phi is this transition function. Is this transition function, which uh, consists of the broken intervals. So it is just a step function. So you, it, it is just a pairs of a, of a character. And then what should be done when this character is, is encountered? Where, okay. 
where the idea is that when, whenever you have a concrete character, you, you look for the pair that is the nearest fit below it. So you look for the highest uh, character in, the, uh, in this step function that is just below it, and it tells you what should be done, which then can be either a transition, which is represented as an integer relative address thing, or, uh, this, or a blocking, which means that no transition is possible. Yeah, and, and it is a requirement that for the minimal character, there is a, there, there is a transition, which I assume is uh, hexadecimal 80 minus 128. So if you want to apply this on the character, you need to find the, the closest fit from below, and that tells you what should be done. Oh, yeah, and then, and then every state has a classification, which, which basically means uh, what, you, what would be recognized if you get stuck in this state. Yeah, and then the classifier is the is a thing that classifies the tokens. It's just a factor of, of these states. So that's it. Here is one. Here is the this is the one from the previous uh, drawing. So this one. Yes. So let's try to read that. So th this is always the initial state. Right. So, so we have two options, while and identifier. So here we have no transition. So this is this minimal character. Minus, from minus 128 onwards, uh, we can do nothing. We are blocked. And there is nothing that uh, corrects this. So the, the initial state, we cannot read any tokens. We cannot read any characters. But we have lambda, we have, but we have empty transitions. We can go to either to one or to four. And uh, this is actually zero plus one, but it happens to be also one. So in one, we have no epsilon transitions, but, and so, so from minus 128, we can do nothing, but from A up to Z plus one, we can go to, uh, we can go one state forward, which is to here. And, and this is the, this is the identifier. The, yes, so from, as also from small A up to big A Z, we can go one state forward, we are here. And, and and in this state, and this uh, okay, why is it error? Actually, it's a bit weird that it's an error state. And there was a reason for this. So I don't know why. So in the, in this state, we're in the error state. Yeah, but it doesn't. So let me think. So if you go to the okay, because at this this is the error state because we haven't read anything yet. So, but if if you now read one identifier or one letter, we're here. So you suppose you read a B, then you yeah, then you go one state ahead. You are here. So now you have error here, but you also have a jump to this one. You can uh, you can make an Amsterdam translation to here, and here you can recognize identifier. So if you if you read a capital B. You, you make one epsilon transition, you make one jump, one real transition where you consume this B, then another epsilon transition, and then here you have the identifier. So, and now if you have while, let's try to have while. So while you go here, again, this is deterministic, and then if you have the W, you can go here, the A, L, E up to here, and then here you have recognized the while. Okay. So... So, and now I'm going to show you this, not here, but in real. So, we're going to show you this in real. Yes. So, because it's nicer in real. So, and th this is the thing in real. It has even more, tra it has even more epsilon transitions, but it, it should be the same. So, if you have a W, you go. And let's try to read this. Uh, you go, you go. In, yeah, the while is recognized here. Right? So you you start if you have a W, you must make the lambda transition. Then here you have the W, the I, L, E, and then here you can recognize the while. Okay. So this is of course. Uh, I, I should show you. I should also show you how this is created. Let's. Uh, I, I forgot to show you this because it's much more interesting how this is actually created. Okay, so now we really come to the tokenizer generator. What is a feature of this of the the tool, the tokenizer generator, is that there are no regular expressions, and and this is a consequence of the flexibility. I, I want uh, the automaton you generate directly in code, so you can generate whatever you want. Basically, you could also write a for loop here. That instead of range, you could write a for loop that uh, just counts all the characters and puts them in the automaton. 
So the, the interface is completely programmable. Uh, that's important for the flexibility. So, so, but but this actually, this auto actually is an automata. So it uh, there, there are no, the reg this this construction immediately generates an automaton, and it it merges it uh, with uh, this automaton, basically by adding them together and putting in the from the beginning epsilon transitions to both uh, automata. Then the, the then yes, okay. Then the this is the this is the identifier. So it's one letter followed by a letter, a digit, or just an underscore, repeated uh, as often as you want. And, and that will be an ident. And here the, the classification class is string, which I just did for clarity, but normally you would use an enumeration type here. Yeah, and then you also add to the classifier just the word while, and if you have the while, you, you classify it as the while. So that is here. So you run it, you have your automaton. Now the second one is the deterministic one. So I said that this uh, this one has these epsilon transitions and these epsilon transitions makes the automaton practically useless, but you can make it deterministic. So that is here, then you have the, so now, now you can, uh, there are no epsilon transitions because uh, yeah, and an automaton that has no epsilon transitions is deterministic. So now you can also, see, in the first state, you see that uh, that you have this interval from A to Z plus one, but the W is taken out here. So from that, from, from, because the, if you if you have a W, you could go for the while, so that, that must be treated separately. So from while, from W to W plus one, which is X, you go to the state three here. And then you can trace the whole while through this. So where's the H? Yeah, the H you go to Pew 8. Where do you see the I, the L, the E? And then if you had it, you recognize the word while. Right? Okay. Then we tell to the students that these automaton, that they are minimal, that they can be minimal, and that the construction does not always construct a minimal one. You see this here. So this automaton is 11 states, but if you minimize it, you have only six left. So, so, if you, so now if you want to uh, see this, if you would, uh, no, you could add some, let's add some extra reserved words. Words say uh, if, you recall that if. So yeah, let's insert the word. I mean, let's take something then. And if you run it now, the automata will be a lot bigger. You, you, you have now a much bigger uh, automaton. And, uh, and, and this automaton can be run and interact with the, with the, yeah, with the file reader in the, in the way that I showed. And, and, and this, this, so all of this you can use automatically. Uh, this is important because you, you really, yeah, so nearly all the tokens in the end, of course, can be written automatically. That's important. You have to see what I want to see more. Okay. So I show you how the classifier is created. I show you the classifier. This I'll show you all of this. Yeah, this is not very important. Uh, let's I go. I'm on, I go now to a real one. So see the this is toys, and now we go to a real one. See the calculator. Name. So, now this is a more interesting automaton. Let's have a look where this comes from. And let's have a look where this really comes from. So, so. And, and this is in the end the, the, the code that you have to write as a user of this. So here you see the letter and the digit, the white space as before. In a white space, you have all these special characters. This is a comment. This, uh, this, is, a, this is a comment that starts with a, with this, what is it, divides uh, slash right slash star and ends with slash star, which is uh, a bit tricky to define. So you, you have a slash star, then you have everything which is not a star. Or you have a, a finite number of stars, but then uh, but then something that is not a, a slash. 
Right? It's, 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 really, yeah, it's a character without, without a slash and not a star. It's infinitely often. So if you have a, a sequence of stars, and then in the end, uh, after that, not a slash, then you, st then you stay in the comment. That's written here. And the only way to get out then is a star and uh, it's, it's a, a sequence of stars and then, uh, and then a slash. And then you're out of the comment. This looks like an exponent for the floating point numbers. See this definition of floating point numbers. Yeah, you, know, you have to get, I think it's I think it's more reason, reasonable than uh, regular expressions. It's a bit more for both, but I think it's, it's it's more readable than regular expressions. So digit plus, so we have a floating point number is a, is a, is a, is a, is a, is a sequence of digit followed by a dot. And then you have it's you have a sequence, optional sequence of digits. Is it even optional? Then an optional exponent, and then it's a double. And uh, this automata has no int. This is why. And here are some more reserved words. So, so you run that, and you. This is the in the end of the deterministic automaton. It is not big. It can use. Uh, let's say if you if you start with a three, then you, this should be a floating point number. So we can try to find it. Do you see a digit here? Yeah, here. Yeah. yeah. So if you have a zero, up to, this this means from digit uh, all digit goes to Q thirteen, and in Q thirteen you immediately recognize a double. And if if say here you have another digit, you it it remains a double. Right, you stay in Q13. If you have an exponent, you go to Q19. Now you can you can recognize nothing because you cannot just have an E and nothing behind it. But if you now have another digit, then you're in 23 and then you're double again. So the, so the, this is it's uh, these automata are rather re readable. So now to show how they are used, that's important. And here is uh, I have to compromise a little bit. So th th this thing is is created. At currently at once once as a runtime, which is done here. And then here, it, this is this read and classify function that I showed before, which uses this automaton. Okay, this is, now this is, uh, let's say, okay, it's, it's somewhat efficient, but of course not as efficient as you want because this automaton is still being constructed as uh, every time when you run the program. And if you don't like that, what you can do is uh, print the automaton, but this is a bit, uh, this is done here. So if you don't like this, what you can do is you can create this automaton. It, it, so it generates code uh, and you can compile this code instead of the automaton and this is optimal. Okay, and now I want to tell. Okay, the question. Okay, so the, the in the end, if you, if you, the, and this is, I I know it's tech. This is of course technically optimal because I uh, I measured it and I I know from the literature from uh, people who wrote uh, implemented such things for C that this is really uh, the they did the measurement that this is as fast as you can get it. This is and, and the problem with this is this is faster than table generated uh, automata. So. Uh, it, it is a bit technically ugly, but uh, and uh, it would be technically more sound from the programming style to generate a, a table. But uh, it is uh, they they claim it, it's claimed in the literature that this is an order of magnitude slower. So this is this part. This I showed how to obtain a maximally efficient tokenizer. So you you in the end you print the tokenizer, and uh, then instead and then you replace the code. That is a bit. Uh, so how the, how you do this in the end is just by uh, by replacing this code. Now the now the tokenized classifier is not constructed anymore, just by an integer. And what happens now is that this get now overloaded in a different way, and actually it just calls this automaton. So now it runs, and so now this uh, now it's running the the, the, the compiled automaton. Yeah, so this, uh, from my point, in a sense, this is the, the really, I think this is the right way of, of creating tokenizers. It has the right compromise between efficiency, I mean, efficiency for the programmer and uh, efficiency on the, on the implementation and flexibility. And one important question is, should one use const expert? Because it, uh, but I think it's not yet ready. So uh, 
this would require versions of const x per vector and map, which I think don't exist yet. And, uh, and moreover, the literature, especially the RE2C, claims that tables are a magnitude uh, of order slower than direct coding. And uh, with in const x, with certainty, you can get only uh, you can get only uh, tables. So. Yes, and this is also important. Uh, theory works, but uh, like only in 99% of the cases, and uh, you need always to have uh, some escape that uh, for the case when the theory doesn't work. And because uh, if you have only a tokenizer generator from regular expressions to the tokenizer generator, and then somebody has one token that doesn't fit as a regular expression, then he cannot use your generated tokenizer. Right. It's the same with static type checking. So static type checking is, of course, a great invention, and it works 99, so maybe comma nine percent of the cases. But there is always, sometimes there is one case that doesn't cannot pass static type checking, and then you still want to. So that then, and for that you have casts. And here it's it's somewhat similar, the same. So the theory works, but you must always have uh, some way of escaping from it and doing something outside of the theory. And I would say that. So I have been now talking for 45 minutes and I, I want now to, uh, to give you the occasion to ask questions. And then in the, in the next session, I will speak really about parsing, bottom-up parsing. <laughs>